Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, real quick before we get started on the show, I'm just going to talk about Treeline Academy. You've heard me say it. I can't even tell you how many times. Uh, Mark Livesey is treelineacademy.net. That's treelineacademy.net. Sign up. Use the promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20 bucks. Can't say it enough. It's awesome. Amazing. Most comprehensive e-scouting course out there. Check it out for yourself. Sign up. Use promo code PC2020. And now let's get to the show. All right, so I'm sitting here and I am talking to the boys from the Outdoor Drive. I've got Trevor Berwick, who some say is a salty old sailor that slays some bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you've got Stephen Clark, who some say has the voice of an angel. I'd have to say, too beautiful for radio. So oh, I don't know about all of that. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> but uh, how you guys doing, man? How's your season been so far? We've had a pretty good season, I'd have to say, overall. <laughs> it, it's been pretty wild, yeah. to, to say the least. This season <laughs> has been wild. I haven't, I haven't seen any like, massive bucks from you, Stephen, but I just missed it. I don't know. I've been trying to keep up on you guys and keep tabs, but let's talk about that then. So how's your season been? We'll go with you first, Stephen. Just kind of walk us through your season, <laughs> what it's been like. Uh, this season has been... Uh, definitely along the lines of the standard 2020 so got out we kicked off the season early uh my my priorities for the year was to get my wife her first archery deer and her first archery buck which she knocked out in her first i don't know two weeks of the season nice. she ended up tagging her first target buck and uh smoked it at 35 yards double long beautiful shot and just a really cool Virginia mountain buck. So check that one off. Trev made it down open a weekend. And the other goal was to uh, knock this, what we called the Virginia curse. Uh, every time he came down, we, we just couldn't connect. So he came down, we ended up smoking a, uh, a nice fat doe out on public. And the hunt itself was actually a bear hunt, but the bears weren't cooperating. So we just kind of shifted gears, but we broke that curse. So that was a big plus. Um, nice. <laughs> from there, we we bounced around public a little bit. I hit some some spots I'd never seen, never put foot on, and uh, you know, I think I I took a doe, two does, mm -hmm. and kind of had the season rolled out. Freezer was full. I was good to go, ready to to start kind of looking for some bucks, and rolled into Ohio. So. I don't want to go too much into detail in Ohio, <laughs> but, uh, I, I will say I had the most absolute heartbreaking moment of my bow hunting career in Ohio. Um, uh, buck stopped a foot before the actual hole I planned at low light. And I hit a, an Oak twig and skipped my arrow clean over his back. And he was every bit of 170 plus. And I wanted to just tie the rope, you know, take my tether wrapped around my neck and jump out of the tree. <laughs> but th there was redemption in that trip. It came around and, and all together, even though I missed that and I ended up missing, a, you know, 125 inch 10 point a couple days later, he ducked my arrow at 17 inches. This deer was Houdini. It was beautiful. Uh, but, you know, it sucks missing a deer, but at the same time, it was a blast. That was the most epic hunt I have ever been on in the terms of whitetail. So really? worth every minute yeah. of it. I, I would to, do that in a heartbeat. I'd have to say that. I mean, Stephen kind of, he, he put everybody else forth, uh, forward before himself as far as the season has been. You know, like as far as trying to get me on a bear and then get his wife, Kim, on a, on a deer. Like his, that's where his focus was at. Um, and then trying to catch up after that, you know, so. There's nothing it's, wrong with that. I no, get it. I get no. it, right? You know, sacrificing for for the greater good. But you know what? Good can't outgive good. So I mean, 
It's going to come back. Around. It'll come back around. You'll get your I figure right sure. now, you know, rifle season's ending in the area that I uh, bow hunt. I, I'm going to go in there and I, I'm praying for some of that karma on the back end and get some of them late season bucks because there are some absolute mountain mutants up here. And if <laughs> I just, if I can do what I do and play the game right, I've got three buck tags to fill. So, you know, first one that yeah. comes by is getting thumped. And then the next two, we're just going to go into that <laughs> mutant mode. You know, I, I got to get that confidence builder and then we'll just roll into it. That's cool. Now I kind of screwed myself. I only get two buck ticks here in Illinois. It was like the first one I took a buck and stoked. I want to take her. She still had her yearlings with her and I just didn't have the heart to do it. So then the <laughs> first buck that walked by, I shoot them. And then afterwards I'm like, man, I can't believe I burned a buck. Tick. It's nice to have the freezer full you know, did. And then, uh, and then I took another, but it was like, no, that now I bucked out. I, my buddies asked me, they're like, you still going to hunt? And I'm like, yeah, of course I'm going to hunt. I still got does to get, you know, oh, absolutely. put them in the freezer too. So yeah, I'll still, I'll still be hunting, but yeah, it's not, I, I'm definitely not going to be hunting as hard. It'll be mostly like in season scouts, like doe killing. But so let's talk about your interesting little go around and uh well you know what before we get into ohio let's uh let's go talk about your regular season trevor all right <laughs> yeah yeah yeah. i'm here man <laughs> i was just i was uh, already getting sucked into the <laughs> yeah. store <laughs> i got a problem with that man i get so sucked in um no i mean my season kind of kicked off with, with a bang um i started off i killed a doe the first week of season here in september uh just kind of get one off off the off the back um that was actually I hunted real hard and had a lot of, I guess, mishaps and then kind of, yeah, you, you know, you've had like, some really odd luck this year. It's kind of been strange. <laughs> yeah. And that seems to always happen. So like once everything kind of like got going off the ground and then, uh, I ended up taking a, a decent dough and then, you know, always, you know, always in the back of the mind was I'm going to Ohio. So like my mind is like somewhere <laughs> That's else where the money was set. Oh. The big buck hunt was Ohio. It was Ohio. So, um, in, in Connecticut, we get four tags. So with the archery, so I took one when I had first gotten there when I first, when I first started here for season. And then later on in the season, I had taken one when I had gotten back from Ohio, but I had chased a bunch of bucks, had a ton on camera, still do. Um, just can't, couldn't, couldn't connect with them before I left. But like I said, man, my mind was somewhere else. It was not here. It was definitely not here. Your story, man. Uh, you know, and then being able to go down and hunt hunt in Virginia and try and kill a bear down there. And then like Steven had said, we got on some some public land and it was the last day well, of hunting. I, I gotta put you on pause there real quick. <laughs> on the last day here, we went out and chased Whitetail. And on the camera where we had been hunting all weekend, the morning Trev left. I had a 350 pounder come right under the stand that we should have been hunting. Man, that and we sucks, chose to go hunt whitetail instead. Well, at least you still got one, right? So, I mean, you didn't go home empty handed. You broke what you might call the curse, right? Yeah. We had to. I mean, I had to. When, when, when they had, we had gotten up on that public, uh, it was a big oak flat, and I, we had split up a little bit, and the deer started coming in. I saw a ton of movement. I was like, it is what it is, man. We got to break the curse. Yeah, first thing big, movement goes down. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> so, um, big nanny doe came in, and I let it rip, and we were able to harvest that doe. That was awesome. So nice. You let the curse off. It's loose, as you guys are yeah. calling it, right? <laughs> oh yeah, we cut the Zeus loose. <laughs> we love cutting the Zeus loose, man. <laughs> no, that's cool. Looks like it leaves a pretty devastating exit wound. But so let's kind of talk before we jump into your Ohio. What were you guys doing? to prepare that kind of stuff. I mean, obviously it seems like on Steven's end might been a, might've been a lot more preparation than, and I'm not cut you short there, Trevor, but you came up and visited him too. So like, right. you know, there, what were you doing as far as like preparing to try and get everybody on something and all that kind of stuff? Was it camera usage or what was it? So on my end, honest to God, this year I decided that no cameras, <laughs> I was doing everything 100% old school find the sign, find the deer patterns just based on what I can find in the woods. So the plot here at the farm, I put it all in and we were able to pattern based on what we were physically seeing and everything out in public. 
no cameras, no nothing. When Trev came down was the first time I ever stepped foot on that land. And we walked in together and went, this looks good. Here's this. We're seeing this. You should set up here. I'm going to go over here. We're going to hit on the other side of this saddle and just see what happens. And I've done that the entire year. No cameras, no nothing. Everything is just old fashioned woodsmanship. That's kind of how I run it. Like I, I just had some bad experience with public land cameras and stuff. So I, I shied away from it and I just don't put them up on public. And uh, it's always, I'll go from, I'll do my late season, you know, or I'll go post season kind of, you know, early, real early spring and try and go and pick up yeah, on so everything. With them rep patterns pattern. are out there and yeah. see what all the sign is left over and yep. plan on that that's, for next year. That's kind of what I've been doing. It seemed, it seemed to really pay off this year and uh, got on it, but I, I, I'm kind of wanting to do that more spots this year. Cause once I kind of got that one pattern and I think I got it pretty good to where I can come back and hit up a few spots and be okay. So I want to try doing that to more public spots now, now that I got one kind of pegged down. What are, what are you doing as far as uh, all that kind of stuff goes, Trevor? See, so I did a ton of camera work and I mean, I run 12 to 16 cell cameras, but I, the thing with that, like I took this big jump and me and a good friend of mine that hunt here, we actually split the camera. So we each got six or eight. And, um, but the thing I was finding was that, I mean, it's, it's narrowed to such a small area. So like, if anything is to change, then, you know, like we wouldn't get that many pictures on, on one camera, you know what I'm saying? And then you go in there and hunt and there was just a ton of sign. So, right. I mean, you were getting yourself into such a small pigeonhole where you're just, you're putting all your eggs in one basket and you're relying on those cameras where I've always been like minimal cameras and then just a lot of woodsmanship, just get in there and hunt, man. Like find yeah, we, that sign. We flip flop this year. <laughs> that Which, should be me. Which, I mean, I, I'm kind of regretting. I mean, it's good to get kind of like a little bit of inventory that like maybe those bucks are chasing or a doe goes by or, you know, like different movement during different times. But like I became so reliant on on trying to find big bucks on camera. And right. I wasn't going in and hunting like I should because I, I'd be like, well, there wasn't a buck on camera. So why would I go in there? And I try and go somewhere else. And then so I kind of like. I just, I, I did it to myself and it kind of, I think it kind of hindered my hunting season, to be honest with you. Um, and I just, I was too reliant on the cell cameras. Right. So, getting tons of camera so, pictures. so touching on that, the, the main reason I went low camera usage and woodsmanship this year is last year I did the same thing. I was heavy cameras. We had a pristine property that supposedly was very low pressured for years and years. We went in during turkey season, put cameras out. We located some absolute giants. And uh, my target buck, which ended up getting taken during muzzleloader season, 200 yards from me as I was in the stand, uh, ended up going 212 inches and was just devastating. But my entire season last season revolved around those cameras where I saw the bucks, what time the bucks were coming through. I can only set this place or this place based on what I'm seeing. And I completely left out the, the wind's not right here, but I could go over here. The wind's right for there. It, yeah. it was strictly based on my mind was lined up on those deer that I was seeing. And to me, after the season, I, I looked back and it almost ruined my season. You know, I, I had opportunities at deer that, in Virginia, I should have shot 10 times out of 10, but I didn't because I was so hung up on what I saw on the camera. So this yeah. year I said, I'm just stepping back. And that's like, like I was talking about a little bit earlier with Trevor before you jumped on is it was like the first day I was hunting on this spot that I knew I had to get to and the wind was perfect. Had no idea what was out there, but I knew the sign was good from the previous year and all my scouting that I did. And I'm and the deer was right in, be, in behind some brush and his head was down and I couldn't exactly see the antler size and it was a side profile. Yep. And I'm like, eh, yeah, I could snake one through, but man, I don't know. And then, so I was on him and he zigzagged away from me and he went about 60, 65 yards and then came back in front of me. And when I saw him, it was behind <laughs> and he had a big old wide butt <laughs> and his antlers <laughs> stuck out. You know, I mean, he was wild, way beyond the ears and tall. And then he turns around. 
I, I did a grunt and he turns around and he just looks at me, turns around, looks, he couldn't see me, but he was looking for that deer. But I zoomed in on him with the camera and I'm like, you're an idiot, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I told my wife, she goes, well, why didn't you shoot him? I said, oh, you know, it was opening day. I didn't want to you know, make a million excuses, but the bottom line was I was an idiot and didn't really, well, well, I, I I'm misjudged. Not, I misjudged. I'm not going to say you're an idiot. One, you were waiting for confirmation that what you were going to shoot was what you wanted to shoot. <laughs> I didn't and know what was out there. <laughs> living here in Virginia, I've seen way too many instances of people who go, there's movement I'm shooting, and it may be the hunter next door. Oh, yeah. no, no. Guys I could getting see, shot at. I so see antlers. I, I 100% antlers. respect that you waited to confirm <laughs> what it was before you shot. <laughs> no, no, no. I could see him. I could see antlers. I saw him coming up from a distance, but I totally misjudged his actual size. When he had his head down, the antlers were going that way. And I was like, oh, he doesn't come up real high. He's not, you know, he doesn't look that wide. I I was, I was way wrong. On that yeah, it's all right. It just means he's, he, he's holding now. If he made it through rifle season, you're good for late season. And if yeah. you don't get him now, he'll be bigger next year. Hopefully, hopefully next year. Cause <laughs> yeah, man, I'm bucked out. Like I said, I'm tagged out. So I can't go after him this year. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but uh, he'll make so, it. It'll be Hopefully. a complete giant next year. Yeah. Hopefully be, I can get on them early, early season. Be on that same stand opening day. <laughs> <laughs> right. Get that pattern. Yeah. So let's talk about uh, trip. Trevor, you kind of had a pretty amazing experience going to Ohio. What was kind of the thought process and the planning on that when you were going into it? What kind of preparation did you do or any of that kind of stuff? So, well, I had to. I, we had planned on going down the same date, um, which was October 30th, October 30th. Yeah. We were going to hunt, hunt Halloween for seven days on. Mm -hmm. And so things kind of opened up for me here, uh, as far as work went and I had been asked to come down a little bit early. So I kind of took the opportunity, which I could, and was able to go down there and it had rained a couple of days. So I was able to get in the woods and do a lot of scouting put a lot of boots on the ground and kind of look at stuff, made a couple of connections with some of our other buddies that were out on the East and get to hunt with them and kind of see what was going on. Um, and it was more or less, man, just getting in the woods and finding that fresh sign where they were in that, that chasing mode or that, I mean, not the chasing mode, the seeking mode. So a lot of deer, there's a lot of scrapes. There's a lot of rubs. I mean, we we're just trying to find that fresh sign. So I had found some sign the first, so the first like two days, I didn't really even hunt. Like I, I hunted a little bit, but more or less just moving around, trying to find stuff and then would know when it was going to rain. So I would really go into places and then it would rain and then be able to hunt them after. Um, the first sit that I did first, <laughs> I, I was sitting in the morning and it was, it was raining, like drizzling wet on the ground. And this is when I realized that I was in a big buck state. Um, so I set up on the bottom of this Creek bed and there was some bedding behind me and the wind was absolutely perfect. So if a buck, I probably blew out what was ever in that doe bedding behind me, but it didn't matter because if something was coming, they were going to come from the other side and they were going to go and they were going to check. So that's exactly what happened, man. The wind had changed and I'm sitting in my stand and I was like, all right, well, if it's going to happen, it's probably going to happen now. And sure than crap, here it comes. <laughs> <laughs> come right down the trail got i just like i had been looking the other way in hopes that like that's where they were going to come from and i turn and i just see antlers just completely on one side and i'm like oh no here it is so the thing's like 20 yards it's got its head down just kind of going along and i go to go grab my bow and i've never seen a deer like this but he just snaps his head up as fast as he can like i didn't even like barely like i barely even moved man like i put my hand Dude, on my those bow. deer in ohio I, I will tell you right now, those deer do not miss nothing. Nope. The They're second you flinch, so they are on you. They're so overhunted. And you can tell, especially on the public, that they're just so used to people in trees. Like, they just, I don't know. That thing snapped its head up. It was like, I don't even, I don't know how to describe it. But so I couldn't hear it come in because of the rain, obviously. And he was just on pins and needles. And that thing's head snapped up and seen me right away and bounded off. And I was like, oh, my God. And I realized that it was a big deer. I didn't realize how you didn't big. You know how big, yeah. <laughs> no idea. So he had put out a camera. Um, this deer was a mainframe 12 with split G2s on both sides. 
the deer was probably in the 170s. Yeah. No, <laughs> no exaggeration. I mean, big buck. And that's kind of when I realized what we were actually dealing with. Um, so that so kind of went from there. Trev calls me and he goes, I blew it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm going, what are you talking about, dude? He goes, dude, you don't get it. I just blew it. I had the giant come through. I had my chance and I blew it. And I went, no, you didn't, dude. You're in friggin' Ohio. Yeah. So just keep doing what the hell you're doing. Hunt it the way you hunt it. Hunt it like we hunt the East Coast. And you're going to see more. And nice. that was, a, I mean, Steve saying that to me was definitely like a big part of it. Because at first, like when you roll up to these places, like, I mean, you would know, Luke, like the ag and stuff like, like, like they, it's, it's totally different, man. Like the woods isn't what we hunt out here. Like we hunt mountains and we hunt like different transition areas and stuff. But like central Ohio, where we were, everything was flat. Like there's like no yeah. like saddles. There's no nothing. Like everything is an ag field. And then there's like little wood lots, like 15, 20 acres. I'm like, I don't even know what to do, man. I hike 15, 20 acres just to get to something that's good here. Like I have no idea, <laughs> yeah. man. Like this is not my normal type of hunting. So at first I was a little bit distraught. Like I didn't really know what to do, but then once you get into some of these woodlots, man, and you realize what ones are the ones that you want to hunt and the ones that have the sign and just sit there, man, and hunt. And it was, it was, it got pretty crazy, man. Like I, we seen a lot of deer and then I had gotten before Steven had come down, I got to meet up with my buddies, uh, Keith from tattooed in the wild and go more to the Eastern side, which is more like mountains, mountainous. So it was more like my kind of woods where the bottoms were all ag fields, um, whether it was soybeans, whether it was corn. Um, and then it was just mountain terrains where we were hunting in saddles and pinch points and a lot of really good stuff that I'm used to hunting. Um, and I saw a ton of deer there too. Um, I wasn't passing on anything. I'll put that straight. Anything that was over like 120 was getting it. It just, everything like either would come in or I wouldn't be able to get a shot, wasn't in a good window, or walked away, or, you know, it just happened one after another, one after another, and I'm like, I'm getting frustrated, man, because I'm like, this is not normal, you know, or I take a <laughs> shot, and it would get deflected, because I did, I shot at a good deer, and it got deflected, but there was a greater plan to that whole entire thing, I I'm, I will <laughs> promise you that, there was a greater plan to it. Oh, yeah. We, and we discussed that that whole time because every day we'd come back, we'd be smacking our heads like, dude, I can't believe this crap is going. What's going on? Mm -hmm. This is insane. You know, we're getting these opportunities, but we can't connect. We're like beating our heads against the wall. And Trev said it best. He's like, look, dude, everything that's going on, every mess we've had, it's because that's not the one we're supposed to have. <laughs> it, it's whatever's meant to be is going to come out and that's going to be the one. And, and and Trev just take it from there. <laughs> I mean, so I mean, so Stephen got down. We came and and he came down and hunted with us. He started hunting with us, and I had found a little bit of sign where I knew that there was some good deer in. Um, but we had waited for the wind to be right. I had hunted it one night, just kind of doing like a scout hunt, and I saw a ton of does. And I knew like that if there was one hot doe in there, that it was going to get crazy. <laughs> And it was, a, and I was going to the east to hunt uh, some of the old sign that I had was hunting for a couple of days. So I was going to do an all day sit there. And I had told Steven, because he had said actually where I had seen the first buck the first time, that was the first all day or the sit when he had gotten down. Um, so he had sat there and I was like, well, if you want to go to somewhere else, I said, this is a pretty easy spot to get into. I can show you on a map and you'll be able to get in there and hunt. And he <laughs> did. And that's when. It was wild. It got crazy because there was a hot doe in there and the amount of bucks that were in there was stupid. <laughs> so Trev, he, he kind of shows me the spot on the map and he goes, park here. Here's your entrance. You know, wind was pretty good for the situation. He goes, but I was here. You need to go this way further. So I went in in the dark, pitch dark. You know, it was three days before full moon and got in there and, and just, kind of glanced up and saw a tree and there were two cat eyes 20 feet up in the tree and i went well someone's hunted here before and they mm -hmm. marked this tree so it must be pretty good and it's right in the area he's talking about so i went ahead and hopped up in this tree and i'm sitting there waiting on the sun to come up you know just starting to see light being able to see what's going on around and i i remember sitting there going you know what 
just take a minute and just enjoy this. And I just kind of sit back in the saddle and, and I said, you know, Lord, if there's something in here I'm supposed to shoot, just, just send it my way. And I opened my eyes and I looked to my right and 60 <laughs> yards to my right is the whitest deer I have ever seen in my life. This thing had to be 24 inches wide and just absolutely ginormous. And I'm just in the, the tree, just like frozen. Cause where he was, his head was facing me. He should have had me dead to rights, but he couldn't see me. So I kind of curled behind the tree. And of course, this was the day I left my camera. It fell out of the truck onto the driveway where we were staying. So I couldn't get the video of it. And I'm just watching this thing going, okay, well, if this thing comes, you know, 20 yards to the left, it's over. It's a 40 yard shot. It's done. Well, he sits behind this log for about 20 minutes, just teasing me. And he turns around and walks backwards and walks into this thicket. And I go, he's going back there in bed because there was a little ridge. I said, he's got to be bedding right there. And sure as shit, sat there all day long. Saw plenty of young bucks, a lot of good does, a lot of chasing, good sign. And at this point, you know, after you've sat there for 12 hours, you're kind of going, all right, all right, come on. Last light. Give me that, that last light luck. Yeah. And I see this doe popping out. I was like, okay, well, she's walking right to me. So me, I, I'm not one of those ones that freak out about, you know, pissing out of the tree stand. So I, I literally, I piss right out of the tree stand. And she walks straight to the base of my tree, sniffs where it all landed, and keeps walking. And I'm going, don't breathe. This, she's got you if you do. And I hear more crunch, and I look back. And all I see is tarsal gland around the tree. And I went, oh, there's a buck behind her. Well, earlier in the day, there was a little fork horn that had been pushing a door around. I went, that son of a bitch is back. And I look around the other side of the tree. And I went, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> it was an absolute unicorn. I mean, the, it's so burned into my head. I went home that night and on the chalkboard drew this deer out on the chalkboard. It has burnt into my mind what this thing looked like. It was insane. Got my bow off. Somehow was able to transition to my offside. And Mind you, this deer is at seven yards. Yeah, seven <laughs> yards at the base of my tree. And on my weak side, and I was able to clip and draw the wrong way, not drawing, you know, push, pull. It was strictly hold the bow in, at your chest and pull back. And kind of transition. It was the weirdest draw I've ever done. And I part of the lessons learned is I should have waited. But got drawn, was able to slide around and peeked around the tree, and the deer had turned facing the opposite way. So he didn't continue following the doe. I was like, well, shit. And I'm sitting there at full draw, and he's facing the wrong way, and he's got shit in front of him. And he turns and makes a big circle and goes away from me, and circles back to the doe. Well, the lane he got on rolled right into a lane that I had marked earlier, 30 yards, and there was about a four-foot window that was completely wide open. And I went, oh, you're walking right into it. You're done. You are dead. And he walks in, and he stops right in that window. And I put that pin on, and I click the trigger, and in my mind, fireworks are going off. I'm seeing this thing on a pedestal, you know, turn sideways, <laughs> you know, call the boys. We're going to party tonight. <laughs> and as that arrow gets to him, I watch that loom not go think right off the top of a tree limb right in front of him and skips right over his back. <sighs> and I about fell out of the tree. Now, this is Halloween, mind you. So yeah, this is technically Halloween. the first day of hunting for us. Technically, right? Yeah. This is the first day of hunting that we have planned is this day. So this is how this starts. Starts out good, right? <laughs> I mean, no, starts because out good and I, bad. <laughs> I, I shoot the guys a message and I just I tell them, look, I just missed a giant. And when I say giant, this deer was 170 plus. And I no shit am not joking you. It could have been bigger, but on the safe side, I say 170 man so yeah. <laughs> that's that, that's kind of what happened there so that's last uh, year <laughs> yeah i kicked one up and i didn't have anywhere to set up and dummy me i thought oh man i pushed it just back out 
I don't have anywhere to set up on them anyway. And I didn't, and I never got back to hunt it. And then two weeks or a week later with shotgun season, 220 inch white tail. So, yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dude, yeah, so stumbled on it. At, at that point, <laughs> so, you know, we didn't have very good weather the next gate day. It was what? 60 mile an hour winds, 40 to 60 gusts. That was about here so, too. I remember. <laughs> yeah. So, we decided that, you know, we're just going to take the day, do some scouting and hanging out and went and looked at some pieces. Uh, sign wasn't great. Tried to get in a few trees and it just wasn't working. Uh, so we bailed out and we were just going to kind of go cruise and look and uh, full draw assassins hit us up. So we decided to run up or further east, get with them, just go glass some fields, hang out, bullshit, did that. And the next morning, me and Trev decided to hit that same spot and just divide yeah, the and wind, conquer. The, yeah, the wind had changed. And we we're just like, dude, next time the wind is good in there, we're both going to get in there. We're going to set up separately and we're just going to divide and conquer. And I'm glad that we did because. Oh, it was great. <laughs> it was insane. So when, when do you talk about this country? Are you talking like the Flatlander country or was it more hilly, like a mountainous? type oh shit if there was a four foot change in elevation you could call it hilly there it was okay. flat as the day is long where we were hunting or when we went out east where you were hunting oh yeah it was just flat like it okay there was nothing there yeah yeah because that's like one of the spots like i love hunting like river bottoms and sloughs and stuff like that right. and getting in swampy stuff where there is actual elevation change like to me that's where I feel most comfortable chasing deer. And one of the places that I drew a tag for a shotgun tag this year was pretty much like you're talking about, like little checkerboard pieces of, of timber, timber pockets surrounded by ag. And so as I was doing my e-scouting, I started marking all these different pins on the map and I'm like, okay, I'm going to get in here. I'm going to check this out. This is all the way on the backside of this property. Nobody's going to be there. It doesn't look like there's much access. Well, I was wrong about the access. And so I get back in there and I start scouting it and I'm bow hunting it just to kind of scout through. And, um, everywhere that I put a pin on the map, there was a tree stand. And then I'm like, man, okay. Yep. And then on the way in, one of my back spots marked out, I counted like 23 tree stands that people had up and I'm going, this is insane. And everybody was set up on the fence rows and fields. Yep. Like, like we were talking <laughs> about, like just all over. And I'm going, these people can literally sit in their tree stand and wave across the field at the four other stands that are there. If somebody's sitting there, it's just, it was insanity to me. So I'm like, okay, how do how do I approach this? So then I just started looking like for any little thing I could cut a track or something and get on. And, and I found a couple little cut-ins that like they were walking through just little tiny windows in the brush and there was tracks in there. And I went in like 20 yards deep. There's a scrape right there. I was like, Oh, okay. So I set up on that and I'm like, man, this would be super hard to get into though during, during like a morning sit. And I'm thinking, well, maybe I could do it, maybe not. So I marked a pin anyway, and I sat there that evening and had a couple of does come past me checking that scrape. But I think the bucks were kind of waiting. I don't know if maybe they caught wind of me or something. The way it, my access wasn't that great, but I had a hard time trying to like figure out what to do on that property other than just like cut a track from the field. I mean, is that something you guys kind of did when you were doing that too, or what? Um, yeah, I guess so. The spot that we ended up we ended up harvesting in that's kind of what we did like we just kind of went down this one tote road um the guy uh eric smith bones that we were hunting with he's like i want to check out this one area so what we did was uh he drove down the end of this tote road and we got in there and we started walking down the, the rest of the tote road was gated and so we started going down in it and i seen that there was just a track going off the off the right hand side of it so then i was like all right let's follow this so we start following it and then it started getting thicker and thicker. And then you started seeing scrapes, rubs, and you're just following the sign until it got. And then you just kept going and you just found tons of bedding. And then it was like, all right, now we know, okay. you know, and then that, yeah. that's kind of how we scout anyways. I mean, I do yeah. anyways. And I think Steven's on the same page there um, where just find that sign, like follow those tracks and just get to wherever you need to go. And like we were talking about before the podcast, like 
a lot of these people hunt those fence rows, man. They don't get into that bedding yeah. ground. You know, like, did you, when you were on that public, did you find that there was signs inside of that? I mean, that there was, um, there was there other was, hunting sign or there was, there was some other sign. Like there was some deer sign where like these spots that I found, but it was like little tucked in pockets and stuff mm -hmm. like off, of, off of the, off of the main ad, And it was like right in the corners of the timber pockets, stuff like that, where there was like good transition, but people were set up right on top of it. I mean, it, it was kind of crazy. And then the whole field edge. I've never seen so many tree stands on a field edge in my entire life. And it was just, what's crazy though, is the three times I went out there, I never saw another hunter. I mean, it was early season. Granted, it was like early season. So, I mean, people were still watching football and like trying to be lazy because it was warmer weather, you know, like, ah, uh, maybe I'll get out there when it gets a little cooler, waiting for that first like cold snap or something. I'm not sure, but it, it was kind of strange to me that I, I saw all those tree stands, but yet I'd always walk past them and never see another hunter. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I, so, and I mean, I was only going to hunt it a couple times just to kind of scout so I could do my shotgun tag, but I lost motivation after, uh, after I tagged out on the box. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, <laughs> yep. It's kind of funny. It's like everything that you hear about is sluiceways, river bottoms, uh, creek beds, so on and so forth. So like every time I go to a creek bed to check one, when you see it on a map, there's like five stands on it <laughs> and you're like, all right, well this sucks. Cause like, that's what everybody hears about. Right. Is, is these creek beds or these sluice ways. And you go in there and there's just stands everywhere. And I'm like, all right, listen. And that's when Steven had said to me, cause I, I was getting to, I was getting a little perturbed, you know, I'm he, like, this he sucks. was deer pressed. <laughs> it sucks, man i'm like this is this is gonna be horrible you know what i'm saying and then steve's like dude just hunt it like you hunt it man just hunt like you know how to hunt and that's what i did and we both did and the amount of deer that we've seen was stupid i mean I, i'm that's not awesome. I'm gonna kid you like it it was stupid i mean when i had hunted uh so on halloween i had shot and missed a deer uh also and dude it was it was insane i'm in the middle of the woods you know, I'm like, I'm in the middle of the woods. We're hunting all these egg. These deer are just funneling right down this, this, this big point that comes on into a saddle and these deer are just funneling right into it. And I'm, I can't believe I missed one. I was stupid, but <laughs> I'm glad I did actually, because then yeah, it, it paid off. <laughs> it Best did. mess of your life. Oh. <laughs> so how many tags did you guys have then for, for Ohio? Just one just buck. A one. Tag yeah, or It's a one buck state. So one buck a piece. I could have okay. got a doe tag, but Let's be honest. Yeah. It's not it's a good idea for it. I'm not <laughs> looking not, for does. Not not a good idea. So so kind of walk me through then uh the scenario of when you got actually got your really, really nice buck. So um so we had divide and conquered. So Steve was like, you know, here, break off here, you'll go up 40, 50 yards. Um, there'll be a tree with two with two uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's two yep. cat eyes on it. So I start walking, dude, and I see the two cat eyes. I'm like, all right, this is the one that he's talking about. So I get up in this tree and I'm sitting there all day long, right? And then so I got the bedding to my left. He's haunting the bedding on the right. He shoot me messages. He's like, dude, the wind's wrong. I'm in the wrong spot. This isn't right. And I went, trust me, dude. I sat there and watched all the deer transition right between those beds. I because didn't realize he had gone another 60 yards past where I told him. Thank God oh, he did. So he overshot the... <laughs> But but the thing is, so you have to remember is Steve has one one thing in his mind where the deer he seen one bedding ground where all yeah. the deer had come gone in and out of, and that's a he whole was different on, one. He was right there. I was watching, and I had seen the two or three nights before a whole different bedding ground where I had been watching. So that's why I'm saying that the wind is wrong. Like I'm quartered, it's quartered right into it, and I'm like, dude, this isn't good. I know it's gonna be bad. And then about eight thirty, I'm in the tree. And I'm watching this bedding ground, and there's this giant eight pointer, bro. He's wide as they could be, probably 140s, chocolate horned giant. And I'm like, oh, this is the one. <laughs> Starts coming up. He goes across over this log. Now, rem remember this there's a log, and he goes to step over it. So I range it. It was 22 yards. He got right there, and that wind had shifted, and I didn't realize it. So as soon as he hit that log, he bolted. I'm like, come on. You got to be like, that's the deal. That was him. That was the deer, man. That's the deer. This would have, oh, I could have been out of this tree. At this point, we're shooting messages back and forth. Dude, I just had a giant and he bailed. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so then, like, I'm, I'm like, now I'm getting upset. I'm like, this sucks, man. Like, nothing's going right. Like, why isn't it? So I'm sitting there, and obviously I'm beating myself up. So then 
about an hour and a half goes by another shooter buck nice 10 pointer high tight real nice buck probably 130s comes in to my right behind me again and it's coming up now but it's kind of come on my right side in between the bedding ground and the oak flat so i'm like all right here it comes so i get all ready and i see him and i turn and it's on my weak side but that's not a big deal and he starts coming up and then he just like turns out of nowhere and starts walking away and i'm like you got to be kidding me. This is just absolutely stupid. So, <laughs> so I'm, now I'm getting like upset, you know, and I think I had seen one or two other bucks, same yeah. thing, just like too far away or couldn't get a shot, so on and so forth. Um, and then it's like an hour before last light and you mind me, dude, I'm beating myself up. Cause I'm like, that's like four or five shooter bucks that I've seen. Not couldn't get a shot too far away. Wouldn't gr- Oh, I grunted at one deer. <laughs> I knew where right. I was. I grunted at this deer, and the thing hightailed, took his leg, his, his tail right between his legs, and ran away as fast as he possibly could. And I was like, "What am I doing wrong? Like, what? Everything is going wrong here. Like, I just don't understand it." But this is how why I understood this after. So there was a little tiny six pointer. Okay, so before you get to the okay. six pointer, Trev shoots me a message, and we're coming in again to this last light, and he goes. Big buck headed your way. Oh, yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. And I was like, okay. So I got the camera on and I've got the bow in my hand and I'm panning, like looking like where. And I'm looking and I'm looking and this 10 point pops out and he's like a 120s. I was like, okay, yeah, that's a shooter all day long. I film him for a little bit. He makes That's not what I saw. That's not what I saw. (laughs) I didn't know this at the time. So the buck he saw bumped this buck towards me. (laughs) <laughs> and I'm watching this buck. This other buck is off further to my left, and I never got him on film because he was well out of range, but he was just there watching this buck. And I watched this thing and watched this thing, and I went, okay, I'm going to go ahead and take him. And I shoot, and that's the one that ducks my arrow. And I shoot Trev a message, and I'm like, that son of a bitch just ducked my arrow. What the hell? And at that point, that's when – there had been a doe that ran by me and then I could see the buck in the background and he bolts right past. And I'm like, the hell is going on? That's when I noticed the six pointer was coming straight in on me and it starts eating acorns underneath the tree stand. And at this point, like things are going through my mind. Okay. (laughs) From the East coast, I'm going to smoke that thing. Right. I'm I'm just going to fill the tag, whatever. I'm not going home tagless. And we still had what? Three days. I think Steve. Yeah. Three Three or four days. And uh, I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, it's just perfect. Nice six pointer. Make a nice euro. I'd be happy. I'd fill the tag. It'd be <laughs> perfect, right? So he's eating acorns. Then this deer starts crawling out of its own skin. <laughs> I've never seen a deer do this, like shaking. Like, he was just like always on edge, like just looking all around. He was like a schizophrenic. And I was like, something's not right. And about that time is when the, the woods had erupted. And I, when I mean erupted, I mean erupted. Like trees were falling. You thought there was like a tornado coming. So I look over my left hand side, and I just see this giant buck, dude. And he's just like ripping up trees, and it's just trees going left and right, and things are just like blowing up everywhere. And I'm like, the hell is going on? So this deer kind of like freaks out and runs off. So I had at that point, I turned the camera onto this deer, and I start filming him. And I'm not even thinking about shooting this deer. I'm just like, this is the most incredible thing, man. It's like making scrapes <laughs> and rubs and just, 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 yeah, just giant. Because no, where it's at, there's no way Trev could get a shot at it. It no, was like physically impossible. No, it's like 75 yards away, but it's in the thickest of the thick. And this, and there's just like barberry bushes just blowing up. And so I'm just filming it the whole time. And I'm just like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Like, this is awesome. <laughs> but in my mind, I'm like, everything's gone wrong. So, like, why? I'll never shoot that deer. It's not going to happen. So I'm just filming it. And uh, it just happened to, like, work out perfectly where I was filming that six-pointer and then turned and started filming him. And so this deer starts coming out of the thick, but he's coming out on, like, a 45-degree angle. And I'm like, all right, if he comes out, he's in. The, when he comes out, he's going to be in that window. It's going to be, like, 35 yards. And it's open. Um, I'll probably take a crack at him. So at that point I grab my bow as he starts coming out. And then at that moment, he just stops. And I'm like, the hell? He turns completely 90 degrees and starts walking straight towards me. And I see that it's a big deer. But I'm like, I, I don't really know. I mean, I know it's a shooter, but I don't know like how big this deer is. So he comes 
and that log that I said that that deer had crossed before, that's exactly the trail that he was on. And I knew when he hit that trail, he was 22 yards. I didn't even have to range it. I would just, in my head, I'm just like, that's 22 yards. So he just comes, comes, and he's looking at the other buck, and he had grunted at him a couple of times. And the coolest part of that whole entire experience was he had, like, bushes and shit all over him. Like, he was just, like, covered in, like, just shit hanging bushes. off. It was the coolest thing in the world, man. Like, the whole entire. It's like a rutting elk coming at you. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, he had half a bush, like, just over his. It was just so cool, that's man. That's cool. So, um. He comes in and I stopped him at 22 yards and I let it rip and I smoked this deer. Like I know in my mind that I absolutely 12 ring this deer. I was right behind the shoulder. I smoked him. He went to go take off and he was like, his front legs were like leaving him. I thought he was going to go down in sight. I had heard him crash where I thought I had heard him crash um, within like 50 yards, 60 yards. And so then I, that's when I had called Steve and I was like, dude, I just shot one and I just, I lost it. I absolutely lost it. He's like, dude, calm down. I can't understand you. I'm like, I shot him. I shot him. He's like, you shot what? I said like a 150, 160. I smoked him. And uh, he's like, all right, I'll come down to you. This, that, and the other thing. So about this time, I'm like, I'm freaking out, man. Like I called, uh, I called a couple other buddies, one of my mentors back home. I call him, I'm talking to him, I'm FaceTiming with him. But I think I'm having a heart attack because I can't feel my hands, my legs, my face is completely numb because my adrenaline and me freaking out, like, just had everything pumping. Like, my hands were completely numb. Like, I couldn't feel my and, – and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I got to get out of this tree, but I don't think it's a good idea. Maybe I'll just leave all my stuff here, but then I'd have to come back up. I'm like, I was just a mess, complete mess. So Steven gets there, and he's like, Trev, this isn't the tree that I told you to go up. I'm like, there's two cat eyes. Like, this has got to be the tree, right? And he's like, no, this is not the tree. So I get down, get all my stuff together. Mind you, I forgot. You got your stuff together, huh? I forgot half of it in the woods. Even when he went back in hunting, he grabbed the rest of it. But I forgot my platform. Uh, I was a mess. It was great. Oh, it was. It was great. So then I get down. And we go over to where the contact point is, and there was nothing. There was absolutely nothing. There was no blood. There was no hair. There was nothing. And on film, like, I'm freaking out. I'm like, dude, that's not the right cluster tree. What? I, like, I, I don't know. It was a mess. And there I was, mean, like, no, how'd the arrow look? Oh, uh, there was no arrow. Oh, no. <laughs> so this Initially. is where, this is where things kind of started to get crazy. So, and in, in, in the film, I knew where he had gone through. He had gone over a tree and back, like, up this one path. And I, I was like, okay, so let's, let's just move forward. So I start moving forward, and then that's where we found half the arrow. So I was like, okay, there's some blood on it. I got half the arrow, so I got good penetration. But there was just, like, trickle, trickle. We were kind of, like, just crawling through. And then we had gotten – and now, mind you, like, it's, like – rabbit pasture like you you it's barely impassable it, it's straight briar like we're on our hands and knees crawling through rabbit holes yeah, yeah. The and there, there was one stick tree that was in the middle and was covered with blood and and i didn't even see it steven it actually went was, right by it i, I, like, I, I can't the tunnel vision, blood. i was like i was like this tree is covered dude you're good keep going you'll find yeah. more so then it had opened up and it had wide and then that was kind of like where we didn't know if it went left or right. And then I just kind of started second guessing myself. And Steven had already said, he's like, man, maybe we should back out. You know, like you're let's go review the footage and let's see exactly what's up. So at that point, like my heart dropped, like I, I was in a whole different world. Like, <laughs> and I, I'm going calm I down. Scared. I was like, just relax. I said, I guarantee you that deer is within 40 yards of where we're standing. But if it's still alive, I don't want to bump it and chase no. it for three quarters of a mile. So let's get out. Especially yep. if it was one long. Like we, there was air in the blood and stuff. So we knew we had, had definitely hit vitals. But we wanted to make sure that we were definitely in the vitals, in the vitals. You know, it wasn't like quartering or anything like this. So that's when we had headed back to the truck. We had met up with Eric. Eric was there. And he had picked up a couple of guys, too. One of the, a couple of local kids uh, that haunt the, the private next door. Um, so we got back. And he's like. The kid Cody was like, what deer is it? What? I was like, listen, bro, 
said, <laughs> we don't need to talk about that right now. I got one thing on my mind. I said, I'm a little psycho. It's not a good time right now. So I go and I whip out the computer and I start reviewing the footage and my computer dies. Oh. <laughs> But in that moment, Cody had seen what deer it was. And he's like, that's split G2. That's a split G2 deer. So he starts showing me pictures of it. And he sends me a picture of the uh, trail cam picture. That's when everything started to really sink in. Like I was like, oh, <laughs> oh no, I just shot a giant. <laughs> what would be back home would be like, that's, that's a once in a lifetime deer. So I'm, I start freaking out. So we get back home, back to camp, uh, loaded up look at it and we see that we punch it right in the center of the shoulder right perfect like in the v like that thing is done yeah. so then we can actually drive forward but we didn't know you know what i'm saying like we weren't gonna it risk it on a deer that big right yeah well that's like uh, on, even on that smaller buck i shot i shot it and i didn't i was so focused because i screwed up a shot earlier in the season and uh so i was so focused on my shot sequence that i didn't notice him and he turned and quartered just a little bit yep. so like he he turned just a hair away from me and so when i shot i one lung livered him that deer took off and there was hardly any blood or you know i so i backed out right away and i gave it a couple hours and as soon as i went back in it was funny i was actually lining up podcast contacting to a guy with a tracking duck so i was like and he goes hey man if you need anything i was like no nah, i don't think so you know i saw my arrow it looked pretty good blah 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 he goes, Oh, that's fine. Just give me a call. If you need me, you know, if it doesn't look quite like you thought. So I get out there and I start looking and a lot of leaves have fallen and stuff since then. And I was like, man, where did all that, maybe there wasn't as much blood as I thought. <laughs> and I start looking and I did like a big 20 yard kind of circle where I knew he, he went and took off. And I'm like, dude, this isn't good. I don't want to push him, you know, Stacked out. And I called the guy and he's like, yeah, you know, give me a couple hours. I'll come out, blah, blah, blah. He ends up coming out. It's been at this point, And I'm like, Oh, I'm never going to find this deer now. And he goes, no, don't worry about it. Dogs don't use the rain. I'm like, okay. I mean, he goes, dogs don't use the blood trail. And I'm like, what? He's like, no, no, they track it by the hoof. I'm like, okay. All right. Whatever. You know, and I'm still freaking out. I'm like, you just don't want to lose any deer. And then, so going through all this and I'm playing it in my head and I'm like, man, it seemed like it was a good shot though. Why don't I have any blood? And the guy goes and within like 10 minutes he was on my deer and it, at that point it had been like six hours later and one lung liver deer was still alive yep. he was hurt bad he didn't get up the dog was like 10 feet away from the deer staring at it in the face and the deer still didn't do anything and i'm like holy crap so i ran back went went all the way to the truck grabbed my bow and put another one in him. but it was like i could not believe the fact that that deer at that point it had been like seven hours oh, and yeah. one lung liver still alive yep still alive i mean if i would have backed out and went in the morning i would have found him and he would have been dead but i mean what how how far could i have pushed him just by doing that so i can't imagine like you're in a different state you know like this this is like home turf where i was at you're in a different yeah. state whole different but ball we're, game. we're sitting there talking to the local cody and and i asked him just out of curiosity i said how are the uh predators around here you guys got coyote problems he goes they're horrible yeah, said, there are dogs everywhere and i went trev we got to get back in there dude mm -hmm. we can't leave this thing overnight you won't have a deer left and and i mean so at that point i mean steven's like dude the thing's dead it's not going far it's dead it's dead it's dead it's dead and i was like all right that's fine and i called a couple other buddies and i'm like what do you think you know and they're like ah, i made that <laughs> shot that thing's dead and i was like all right but at this point i mean if anybody knows me i'm very high test man i'm i i'm I freak out. And I mean, it was so bad that when I left, when I left to go review the footage, okay. My I wasn't going to say is, it. That's all right. I don't care. So the, the, my, my memory card is in my laptop and I take my laptop, I pack it up, I put it in the car, we drive. Well, my camera was on top of the car. So I drove and my camera fell off the top of the car and was in the parking <sighs> spot where I was at. When I came back, I almost ran it over. Okay. That's just like my mind. Like I'm, I don't know, like ADHD, bro. Like I see a banana and I just got to go walk to it. Like I'm just, I'm a mess. And especially at that point, I'm like very high energy. So my mind is in all different kinds of places. And and even like to even point out even more of how, what kind of place I was in our buddy, Damien, that's from Ohio. That was kind of like helping us out and talking to us while we were there. 
he sends me a picture. He shoots like a 160 something, 170. <laughs> and I looked at the picture and I'm like, oh, Damien shot a nice deer. And I just closed it. And I didn't actually I actually didn't even know. I said, oh, somebody you didn't even know it was Damien. <laughs> no, I didn't. I said, I said, hey, somebody shot a really nice deer. Look at this, Steven. And I just closed it. And that was it. <laughs> yeah. And then after we had gotten my deer, I'm like, yo, Damien shot a giant. Like, look at this thing. <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah. what kind of mode I'm in. Yeah. So we get back in there and um, there was a couple of us. Cody had gone in there with uh, his two buddies and then me, Eric, and Steven. So we just kind of like took it slow and just kind of moved it forward. And I start going. So we get to the V and I'm like, I think it maybe went left. Like on this <laughs> angle, it's, it's just got to go left. So I start going forward and I'm looking. I'm like, there's nothing. There's nothing. I said, Steven, you guys see anything back there? He's like, nah, there's not much. So I just keep going along. <laughs> He's like, hey, you got that spotlight? He said, come over here. I need you to shine up here. I think I found some blood. So I go back and I shine, dude. <laughs> the white ass right in the middle of the trail. Oh. <laughs> he cut off to the He's left. And we're sitting there, me and Cody, and we're, we look over and I, I was like, there he is. There he is. He's right there. So watch this. And we just kind of sit there like, no, nah, man, we're not, we're, we don't see nothing. There, there's nothing over here, dude. Not a good like, time Trev's to like mess starting me. to panic. <laughs> like, hey, Trev, dude, bring that spotlight. Just shine it down this lane real quick. I want to look at something. And he shines it over. I went, Trev, there's your deer. And he just looks at me and gives me this go to hell look. <laughs> <laughs> so mad. Like, we're laughing. We're dying. Just rolling. I was like, dude, let's go get it. And we start That's walking cool. up. And I, I remember him walking, and it kills me because we lost the footage. We had a memory card go bad, and I'm following. It couldn't him. have been because it got ran over or something. Right? No, 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 <laughs> no, different it was camera. A different camera. He he didn't find the camera till after we got the deer. Right. So I had my camera, and my card went bad, and I'm following. All I remember him hearing goes, "Holy shit!" <laughs> and he just freezes. <laughs> And he looks at me and his eyes are this big around. I was like, go get him, dude. <laughs> it was great. He got ground. That's growth. cool. Yeah, it was it yeah. was something else. So that it just like you guys talked about the whole predator thing reminds me like to this day, it still bothers me that I was watching my brother-in-law and he was haunting a piece of property and, like my parents and a uh, little chunk they had. And I was watching out the window because I got from work and I was watching and I saw where he was set up and I watched these does come in and his first year, right? His wife's there with them. He shoots it. I see two does take off. I'm like, Oh, he shot one. Awesome. Watched them watch where they took off. And it's like, no, I think it went over here. I'm like, well, I just watched it go over here. There was no blood anywhere. No blood. And he's like, well, I was like, did you hear crabs? I don't know. My heart was pumping so much. I didn't hear anything, you know? And I was like, okay. So we looked and it was like last light, you know? And I was like, we'll come back in the morning, come back in the morning. And that thing, there was nothing left but the head. Yep. That's how bad the coyote too. I mean, just nothing left. Like there wasn't even like your lower shank left. There was no meat. I could not, I've never seen anything stripped clean like that before. It looked like dermisted beetles got a hold of that thing, just an entire colony, and just cleaned it. It was insane. So right. you're probably <laughs> that I, Stephen that, told that you was, to go get it, dude. When he said there are bad problems with predators, I said there's no way we're letting this thing sit overnight because no. the week before, a good buddy of mine in Oklahoma had the same thing. He had just shot one, let it sit overnight because it was a questionable shot. And when he got there, there was nothing left but the head. Now, in my mind, I'm going, we're not, no way. We can't risk that. Yeah. So, And we deal with predators real bad up here, too, where my brother shot his first deer uh, quartering two on a steep angle, and he shot it. But when it had come out, there was gut on it, and he was by himself. So he calls me, and he's like, Trev, you know, I got a little bit of green, this, that, and the other thing. I said, all right, you got to back out. We'll go in in the morning. And so – he calls me and he was kind of nervous and I'm like, Hey man, you know, it's going to rain. I said, let's give it four or five hours. We'll give it a shot. If we lose it, at least, you know, at this point we've made a valid effort. It's going to rain in the morning. So you're going to probably lose most of the sign anyways. We'll get back in in the morning if, if worse comes worse, but we need to go in, inside and make a, make a judgment call. So I go in there with him and we went like 50 yards and we ended up finding the deer. He smoked it, but it was just hard quarter and two. And when it had come out, there's green. But in four hours' time, it was the same thing like your brother-in-law's. 
where it was just a head and they literally stripped it from a little four bit of hours and four hours from the front, front shoulders and its head from everything back was completely stripped and there was nothing left to it. And that was his first deer ever. And it was just like one of those yeah. things. That, and that, that burns in my mind. Like if I was to lose a trophy like that, I'd lose my, I would, I wouldn't know what to do, man. Yeah. I think it actually kind of hurt him a little bit on the whole hunting thing. I don't even know if he, to this day, I don't know if he deer hunts on a regular That's basis or anything anymore. And it probably my fault. <laughs> it but I mean, I, I just, there was no button. I'm like, oh man, I saw him take off that way. So that kind of we're okay. And then we kind of went back the other way. And by that time it was, it was just so dark. We were like, you know what? Just go in the morning. First thing morning we went out first light and owned it in about five, 10 minutes. It was it was gone but yeah dude even though like my buck that i shot it, if i wouldn't have watched him go down right where he went down and then it was like dark and stay down i might have questioned myself because they just completely covered in blood there was about five drops and he walked off like a drunken sailor and just toppled over but it was like where i initially hit him in the first couple of steps there wasn't any blood until he until he hit the ground it was kind of crazy and I mean, it was, it was like right in the V pocket there on the shoulder too, and double lung and he was done, but same thing. I mean, it's just, sometimes it's weird. to get that blood like that. Is it a, was it a higher shot? No, no. I mean, no. it was, it was, yeah. it, it wasn't, it was real low on the heart or nothing. It was mm-hmm. right in that pocket, you know? Wow. It so was, I got to ask what broadhead were you shooting? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh boy. Not cut a zoo loose, but I am <laughs> shooting the um day six of those. And I gotta say, I have his shoulder blades and it just punches right through them. Actually, I've used the same broadhead on two deer, three shoulder blades total on two deer, right through the scapula. And all I do is resharpen it, touch it up to a paper wheel with some polishing uh, compound on it, and I think nah. And as long as you didn't shoot a rage, I'm, yeah. I'm okay with it. <laughs> that, that, and no. Love me, hate me. Your listeners may hate me, but rages fail. Period. Steve, I, I shoot adult arrows. So. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I feel you. I'm on the same page. <laughs> we, actually, I broke out of the whole adult arrow thing. Like, what? I, what no are you chasing the speed why? again? No, not chasing the speed. So, all right. So, it's kind of crazy. And, so I used to, I, I used to shoot adult arrows. I used to shoot buck 608s. Um, and I loved them. I mean, they did everything that, that it needed them to do. I mean, I don't know if you ever shot a turkey with something like that, but they literally leave their feet. <laughs> it's the hilarious. craziest thing ever, but awesome. <laughs> yeah. When you hit a turkey, I have it on film. They literally leave their feet. Like it's just the, the power and the kinetic energy that connects with them is insane. But, um, the way that the, the Zeus is designed, um, it's made for more speed. So you get the that what the heavy what the adult arrows would do as far as penetration but it's they get it in speed so like when you shoot mine <laughs> hmm? mine aren't extreme front of center or nothing i mean they're only like they're only like 14 maybe 14 and a half somewhere in there like not yeah. crazy mm-hmm. you know that's about like but they're mine. heavy yeah i'm like I'm 608 fingers, though oh i i'm shooting 550s at 14 percent foc and uh, yeah all so we're close build. i mean yeah, uh, but the way those Zeus's are, like Trev's deer in Ohio is the absolute perfect example, where he hit that thing dead centered the shoulder. You know, I I don't mean like the lower small thin part of the scapula. He centered. hit it centered in that ridge. If you've ever skinned out a shoulder on the front of a deer, <laughs> there's that ridge that comes up. Yep, and he went through the ridge through the cavity, both lungs, nicked the heart, Mm -hmm. cut the artery, got through the other side, snapped a rib. Yeah, went through a rib, yeah. The only thing holding that arrow from getting that full penetration was the broadhead was touching the skin. That's all it was. Yeah. We literally, yeah, we literally lanced the skin and pulled the broadhead out. Very interesting. So mechanicals thing, are tougher than I thought then, huh? Yeah, it's not well, even a mechanical. It's a hybrid. Yeah, that's the cool thing okay. is that it doesn't right. open. It, it closes. Fixed. So when it connects okay. with bone at 48 pounds of pressure, it goes down to one eighth of an inch so that the surface area is less so it can re- not restore, but 
not use as much energy to get through bone. And then when it goes through, then it goes back up to the two and a half inches cut in diameter. Interesting. Very yeah, it's interesting. different. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we've had yeah. very good luck with it. I've shot a ton of different broadheads. I just one yeah. that works well. And, and and the thing is that when something bad happens, like in that scenario where I hit bone, it's there for it. But on a normal yeah. hit, it acts like a normal broadhead, you know? So, I mean, there's... Yeah. So on nice. on my adult yeah. arrows, we'll say, so yes. Jeff shoots the traditional Zeus, which is the collapsible blades. I shoot the Ares, which is a fixed blade, single bevel, uh, adult arrow type blade that's made for <laughs> heavier arrows. Yeah. And they also have the heavy metal, which really amps it up. So you're getting into the 200 grain heads at that yeah. point. And, and they're, they're disgusting. I'm, that's all yeah. I can say is you that's take crazy. this to a taxidermist, and they almost hate you after shooting one of them. <laughs> My taxidermist yeah. gets mad. He goes, ah, you and them damn Zeus broadheads. He said, stop shooting those things. I'm sick and tired of stitching up the holes. That's what he tells me all the time. Yeah, it just splatters. It's, crazy. it's insane. But, no, that's pretty cool. So I just real quick was wondering about uh, about your equipment. You guys are both saddle hunting now? Yep. Yep. Did you? Were you doing tree stands last year a little bit, or did, were, was it all saddle? No, all saddle. Been in saddle guys, for two years straight now. This is my third. And how? What have you did, like change things that made it really work for you versus uh, versus just kind of you know using it the way it came or whatever? So as like as far as modifications, <laughs> yeah, like modifications or change things up a little bit. Like decided so, to go with a new platform or something just kind of i'm kind of curious because i i exclusively hunted out of the saddle this year and there are things i've already kind of changed up but right nothing major so it, like in my situation uh i'm a budget hunter like i do as much do it yourself as possible last year i hunted a homemade saddle the entire season and worked out great was cool uh, built my own platform out of a old, old, old aluminum uh, hang on. Just made some modifications to it. So, you know, it was, I don't know, two pounds, something like that. And that, w that was my rig. It was a homemade saddle, homemade platform uh, using, you know, go to Dick's Sporting Goods and get lineman's rope and use that as your tether and et cetera. Everything was as cheap as you could do. Well, I quickly learned that a homemade saddle is not very comfortable. Uh, so <laughs> this year we, we did upgrade and uh, made some adjustments there, but I ran the same platform. However, in Ohio on the last day, the platform had, <laughs> I had two pieces fell on me. So I was ended up, thank God I use uh, wild edge steps and had a ring of steps. <laughs> so I ended up spending that last day there just running the ring of steps, um, came home actually did work, got the platform rebuilt, did some adjustment with some uh, all thread and recreated it. It's just heavier now, which sucks, <laughs> but you know, is what it is. And other than that, I really haven't modified much. One modification I do want to make is I want to switch out the, uh, the webbing bridge and kick it completely over to Amstill just for that smaller profile, the easier slide and better strength um other than that i really haven't modified anything um my tree hanger setup my bow hanger all of that uh, me and trevor on a very similar situation he ordered his through uh what is it big white tail dreams yeah. and that is an absolutely game changer can't say it enough if you want to find something really good that's publicly and legal their setup is absolutely perfect for bow hunting i saw his and made a we'll call it a white trash version out of some <laughs> old stuff i had here some old webbing and a camera yeah, or something. yeah. yeah. And, and just yeah. modified some aluminum got some uh some kydex form some kydex into some hooks and made my own works great but it's not quite as smooth as the system they have <laughs> yeah. uh takes you know a little more finesse to get it where you want it and other than that, I haven't changed anything. See, nice. I run, 
I run pretty much basic stuff. I mean, like I, I haven't really changed much. I mean, other than my sticks, I'm running the Shakar 17s. And with those, I have a daisy chain that I had made and um, a 22-inch loop aider uh, off the bottom of them. And other than that, I mean, I pretty much run everything pretty much stock. Right now, I have um, an out-on-the-limb podium that I run for a platform. And then I also have a uh, wild edge. Uh, the battlement. The battlement. And I run stock steps i mean it's all depending on the situation i have a bunch of presets that are made up and i'll run uh i'll run a ring of steps on them and i'll run uh i'll just bring a perch with me on my presets so i just snap that in um and then everything else like my mobile setup i just have the podium or the battlement and then my my uh my four uh 17 inch uh shikar sticks so other than that i mean i haven't really modded much i so I was a bigger dude, so I didn't really want to mess with stuff. So I just kind of like go dude, with what it is. Trev, you, know, you like, got to quit saying you're a bigger dude because I was. Yeah, I said last was, year yeah. you yeah. were a bigger dude. This year yeah. you weigh less than me. I know. I so I was 300 <laughs> saddle hunting. It was like 280 and some change. Um, and a lot of guys always ask. They're like, you know, they're like, well, I'm a big dude. I'm six two, 260 pounds. I'm like, I'm six foot 280. And I will saddle hunt all day long. Like that doesn't bother me, but I wouldn't do much mods until I, you know, now being a little bit lighter and stuff. Cause at first, I mean, dude, it's not, I mean, being 20 something feet in the air and being that big is not fun. I mean, when yeah. something rocks a little bit, you start freaking out. I mean, now it's different. I'm like a monkey in the tree, but before it was like one of those things that like, I didn't want to change nothing, dude. If it wasn't stock, how it came, I didn't change nothing. Cause right. you didn't know, like you were touching limits, you know, like that was one thing why I wanted to go to saddle hunting because like ladder stands are 300. Yeah. Oh, I surpassed 300 just putting a backpack on my back. Like that's not, I mean, yeah. I carry my bow and arrow up the tree and I'm over 300, you know, like it's just, so I kind of, that's when I had gone as far as saddle hunting for the safety aspect of it. Because if you don't, then they're crazy because yeah. you're locked in the tree all the time. I mean, yep. Some of the stuff that I mean, I use eight millimeter rope with uh with um Kongs. Kongs. So I run those more than the uh Prusik. Um now Wild Edge has a Prusik with a lazy man on it, a lazy man Prusik. I don't know if you've ever seen those. Is but... that like an uh Prusik like an assist thing yeah, on it yeah. or something? Prusik, yeah. A Prusik yep. attender is what yep. they're called. Yeah. That's uh, one of those from Austin over at Genesis 3D. Mm -hmm. That's pretty cool. And we I have use that a, a little bit. I'd only use it on my uh, on my lineman belt, though, so it's easier. Okay. On the other one, I find it's easy enough to just grab it, you know, yeah. on my actual yeah, anchor. On your tether. Yeah. Yeah, and anyone who's out there that's curious about how to do a do-it-yourself uh, on our Instagram page, I do have a walkthrough video of how to make a Prusik attender. So pretty cool. What do you are you whittling it out of wood or what? Are you, what are you making it out of? No, no, it's out of 550 parachute cord. And, uh, oh, you can. Okay. I never even thought about doing yep. it that way. Like and this one's no, actual, like a hard 3d printed, like a figure eight that goes in that you can pull on your, now, on this, your thing. This one's a do it yourself, 20 cent. And it where I've ran it all year long. I've had a lot of other guys run it long and I'm actually very surprised at the longevity of it. I thought it'd burn out and it's done incredibly well. So, uh, again, I'm a, okay, here's this. How do I do it myself cheap? <laughs> and did it. It worked out great. Got a lot of guys using the exact same thing. So if you are a budget-friendly kind of guy and you need that real quick fix, there's that up. However, I do put this out for front. This is not like a patented anything. This is just a simple climbing knot used by tree workers for years and years. And I am not going to guarantee your safety or anything behind <laughs> it. So build it, test it yourself. You made it. It's on you. Yeah. That's all cool. I'm saying. And that's the thing with D D DIY saddle hunting. Like, bro, you're testing some limits. Like yeah. when you start messing with things and playing with things, that's why I didn't understand. Like when I had gotten into it a couple of years ago and you're like, you see these guys they are trying to get up the trees with toothpicks and, and, uh, yeah, and, the one uh, stick floss. method. <laughs> Come on, man. Let's be real here. You well, it's know like I got a buddy that uses an ascender, and I'm like, oh hell no. I so I, I tried you... it last year, just curious, and I was like, no freaking way. I'm like, so you go out there, you gotta find a tree, throw a bag through it, pull your cord through it, tie it to another rope, 
pull that, that rope through. Yeah, and do yeah, the hip it's, thrust it's, for 30 feet. And I'm like, okay, I'll carry my four sticks and just, yeah, and I, I, I can't imagine it being any faster. I mean, I really can't. No, it's not. It's actually I slower. Them. I hang my sticks on some loops of paracord mm -hmm. on my saddle. I put my pack on, got the bow tied off to my saddle as well. So it's hanging, you know, it's on the ground and I got 30 feet of paracord. I go up in the tree, I do all my stuff. And I just pulled the ball and hang it on the hook. Like, I don't mm -hmm. understand, you, you know, how it could be. The only thing I want to do is I got to change up my sticks. I'm going to get rid of the ones I got, helium sticks. And I really want to go with the ninjas, but maybe not now. That's a little costly adventure. So <laughs> yeah, when you get into that, it definitely is. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'll, it's worth it though. I'll, I'll tell you eventually. that. Oh yeah. It's, those, it's worth it. When cars are the nastiest things I have ever seen in my life. <laughs> just saying stupid bro it's it doesn't even make sense like as far like once you start to use them and 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 really build your climb them things are crazy and they're light i mean dude it's one one pound six ounces a stick i think it might even be less than 22 something like that i don't yeah. know i can't do it's the math stupid. in my head but um but yeah they're they're stupid light and i carry four of them and they just strap on my backpack and it's the You're same right. thing paracord them and then just just work them out the tree. And the cool thing about that is like, so you're seeing a lot of kickouts, right? A lot of kickouts with sticks, with the with the hawks. Yeah, actually, it, if you, I, at first I saw a lot. I actually figured out how a lineman belt actually works sliding <laughs> on the tree and how it catches you. Oh because yeah, because I kicked out and it was like. Luckily, I only had one more stick down, but yeah, the stick kicked out. And I learned that you actually got to put more attention on that daisy because mm -hmm. I use the daisy chain webbing as well. So you really got to kind of figure, okay, where am I going to go with that versus yep. uh, get just playing around and kind of, oh yeah, here it fits. Put it on, pull it down. No, you got to, you yeah, got to think about that tension. tension on there. It's got to, yeah. it's got to bite. If yeah. it don't bite, it can kick out. And that's the thing. So when you're looking at sticks, things that have big teeth on them, that really bite like those shakar sticks when they're tightened on and you go and you take them off you literally can't get them off the tree i could probably step on them and they're still built into the tree that's as much as that bite is but with the daisy chains have you ever seen where they take the loop and they go through the daisy chain and then they go back through the daisy chain and they use it as a torque to tighten it to the tree so that it doesn't pop off and no. then they use the ropesman i'll have to send you the link of it okay um, and then you could share it or whatever but it's yeah. actually pretty cool um ariel uh aerial assault is that i think is his name but he goes through and then he goes through the loop and then he uses it as leverage to tighten the the, the stick to the tree and then he does a um uh a, a, a rope mod on the on the actual um button and it hmm. yeah it's insane because it, with cool. those kickouts because the sticks are just crazy with kickouts so he's seen a lot of injuries that way so nice so speaking that you guys are talking about all these cool things that people won't, might want to look up or something where can they find you guys before we go just kind of talk and uh tell them where they can find you guys and where's your podcast and all that stuff definitely so uh the video aspect we have the outdoor drive youtube channel which the ohio hunt and all the film from there is up on there as well as the uh, doe hunts we're fixing to upload another hunt coming up on there and we'll have some more coming up through the winter so uh check that out give us a like and subscribe there we would appreciate that uh, as far as the podcast goes you can follow find us on all major platforms as well as on youtube and on youtube there are video casts so you can see the guests and uh it's all under the outdoor drive so we have you can also go to our website the outdoor drive podcast.com so you can find everything and links to everything there Yep. And Facebook, Instagram, all that good stuff too. Yep. The outdoor the drive. Outdoor drive. That's it, right. man. Guys, I appreciate you coming on and talking to me and sharing your season and the knowledge that you gained and all that kind of stuff. And good. I appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having us, bro. We really appreciate you, you know, taking the time and having us. I know it was kind of hard to get us uh, crazy <laughs> guys on. I mean, it's never easy. Hunting season's wild, man. Yeah. I, I understand. Crazy. Totally. <laughs> Well, it's good talking to you, man. I appreciate it. Like I said, and uh, thank you so much. Have a good night. No worries. Appreciate Thanks, it, brother. Man. Once again, thank you so much for listening to the Publicly Challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. 
Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenged.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show. Thank you.